Sorry. Ok, so, uh, merci beaucoup à tous pour l'invitation. Et je suis très content d'être ici à Paris. Um, and uh, I'm now going to speak in English for the rest of the talk. I also have some slides which I would like to share. We tried them before and they were working. Let's hope they work now as well. I hope that you can see that. Um, so the talk is entitled The Complex Nexus of Evolutionary Fitness. Um, and this is quite a quite an interesting new topic for me um, in some ways, although in some ways it is not at all new because what I'm doing in this, in this talk, and there is a paper that also goes with the talk, which is already available for anybody who wants to see it, is that I'm putting to use my ideas on probability, which are quite old, in fact, very old. Um, I'm putting them to use in an area where I haven't really tried them out before. And that's in the field of the philosophy of biology and evolutionary biology in, in particular. So the background to the, to the, to the talk is that um, I've for, for over two decades now been pushing for a um, different and a novel um, approach to the study of objective probability in the philosophy of probability. Um, I've applied it quite successfully as far as I'm concerned. Certainly, I find it convincing to the area of physics. And I've sort of made myself known for arguing for propensities in quantum mechanics in particular. And what I do in this talk is that I use the same ideas um, on probability and I put them to use in a different area. And this is really just one of a series of different exercises that I plan to do over the next few years in applying this framework in objective probability and chance to the different areas of science where uh, probabilities appear prominently as part of statistical modeling practice. And evolutionary biology is a prominent place. As it happens, I found out doing the research for this project that it is a very hospitable place for my views on probability. Um, people who work in the philosophy of biology have been defending similar views. Um, to the ones that I defend for quite a while. Um, I didn't find it so hospitable when I was trying them out in physics where there is a lot of resistance to propensity talk. But it turns out that in evolutionary biology, propensity talk is on the whole very welcome and I would even think a dominant paradigm to think about such concepts as fitness. So I, I found it uh, very satisfying to put these ideas to, to use in this, in this particular area. So first of all, in the talk, I, I give you a little bit of my general framework, this framework that I've been developing for many years now. Um, first of all, I draw a distinction between two different um, enterprises when it comes to studying objective probability and advocate uh, one of them. Um, then I, I defend, uh, uh, I outline the views that I've defended for years now which uh, concern chance and which essentially um, generalize the pluralism of all the authors about probability to objective probability. Then I, in section three, I'll move on and I'll um, do a very general, very quick, very fast summary of propensity interpretations of fitness throughout um, the years in the philosophy of biology that will be very quick. Um, and then I'll present two problems for propensity accounts of fitness. Problems are widely discussed in the literature and they are regarded as important problems for the propensity account of fitness. And then what I'll try to do in, in section five is to solve those problems from the point of view of my approach to objective probability, which is not uh, exactly a propensity interpretation of fitness, but something more complex as you will see. And I'll just finish with some comments sort of um, looking ahead and what more can be said um, in this area when one switches um, one's uh, framework for thinking about probability in this way. Okay, so as I said, the, the ideas concerning probability are, are actually old. I, I recently published a, a, a volume, a, a slim volume, you will be glad to know. You can read it in a weekend with uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, it's only about 70 pages long, but uh, all my um, up-to-date um, views and probability are contained there. 
So um, if you're curious about finding out more about what I say in the first part of the talk about probability, that's really the best reference, the best place to go and look. But there isn't really any, anything that is really new in the, in the book. There's some new terminology, but essentially all the ideas appear already in a very lengthy introduction that I wrote to this book that I edited on the left for Springer. Um, that was some probabilities and propensities in physics. And as I said, there's a very long introduction there and that's really the origin of all the ideas on probability that I'm presenting here today. And in particular, the pluralism that I will be defending, you already find it in this, in this book. But there it was confined to a discussion about the role of probabilities in physics. So now, as you can see, I'm generalizing. And in the little Cambridge book, I do have case studies from all over the place, from epidemiology, from uh, 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 genetics, from our areas of evolutionary biology, from chemistry, and even from astrophysics. So the, the plan here is that the, the original ideas on probability sort of generalize over a very large um, number of different um, branches of, of science where statistical modeling is prominent. Um, so that's basically the biographical bit that I wanted to give you. And now just to tell you a, a little bit about the overall framework. So in order to introduce the way I think about probability, I have to tell you a little bit about how I see these two distinct traditions playing themselves out in the philosophy of probability. And I am keen to distinguish these two traditions. One is really the philosophical tradition of interpreting probability. And this is um, very much linked to all kinds of attempts to find out what the ontology is of probability statements. And more particularly, this kind of inquiry is driven by the question about the truth makers of our probability statements. That is, when we use the term probability and we use them, and when scientists use this term in their discourse, what is it that makes these statements true or false, as, as it may be? What is it that makes them, in the first instance, truth apt? And secondly, what's the reference of those statements that makes them true when they're true, false when they're not? And here, as you all know, um, uh, uh, along the 20th century, there's been a lot of philo uh, philosophical developments dealing with this question. Broadly, they divide into two different schools, the objectivist and the subjectivist school. The broadly or roughly put, the objectivist school finds the truth makers of probability statements in the world, either as facts or properties of entities or things or systems that make those statements true, and statements about the chance of events, of chancy events. Well, as you know, the subjective interpretations I said that the truth makers of probability statements are really in the mind. Um, typically, they're associated with degrees of belief or credences, partial degrees of belief that agents may, may have in different propositions. In either case, the project is really the same. It's a project about finding or locating, whether, whether it be in the world or in the mind, some kind of entity that makes those probability statements true. So I take it that this is a project primarily in ontology. So I flash it here in, in red. It's a project about finding out what is it that stands out there that our probability statements are responsive to. Um, and oh, there are many different schools and different attempts to answer this differently, as you, you know, and there's a very lengthy and involved philosophical discussion about every one of these attempts. Keynes famously defended a, a logical interpretation of probability, a sort of subjective um, kind of interpretation, although he claimed that it was subjective in some kind of sense as well. Uh, von Mises is famous for defending a sort of objectivist interpretation of probability statements that locates the truth makers in the world as frequency ratios in what he called collectives, which are um, experimental systems that give rise to regular repeatable patterns. Um, Popper find, found the, the truth makers also in the world, but in different entities in what he called propensities. The propensity interpretation is another way to try to interpret probability by providing the truth makers of the statements. And this goes on all the way to the present day, perhaps the most influential current attempt um, to engage in this project and solve this problem is that of David Lewis. And there are many Lewisians around these days who defend uh, best systems account of um, probability that's supposed to explain what is 
collected in the world and in the mind, because it's a sort of combination in Lewis's work of both uh, that makes our probability statements uh, true. Um, so all these attempts are primarily attempts in ontology. And then once you answer this question about the ontology of the uh, truth makers of our probability statements, you can proceed to study science and the way that science uses those probability statements. But there's a distinct um, tradition, which I, I nowadays find I'm more in sympathy with, which is to roughly start the other way around, to begin with the methodology of scientific statistical modeling and the way scientists use the concept of probability in their practice. And then if, if anything, to derive the ontological consequences from that. So this is really a, a, an approach primarily in, in methodology, in the study of the methodology of modeling sciences. And it's driven not so much by the question of ontology, although it also engages in that question, but it's not driven by that question. It's rather driven by the question of trying to understand what is it that scientists do when they provide an insightful account or model of particular regular or probable phenomena? What is it? What are the elements are um, generally universal in our kind of modeling practices when it comes to the use of probability in, in the sciences? And, and curiously enough, this also begins with some philosophers, um, although nowadays it's more prominent among um, statisticians, maybe than philosophers. But, um, but the, the origins of this uh, uh, framework uh, uh, and tradition are also located in the, in the work of uh, Charles Peirce in the first instance. I don't know if you, if you know this, but Peirce never had any employment in his life other than as a geodetician. Um, studying um, the East Coast of the United States. Um, and that's where he really learned everything about probability. And he learned it from that kind of a statistical modeling practice. And a lot of he, what he goes on to say, he's a defender in the reality of chance, of course, well known, but it's deriving from that practice that he engaged in as a, as a, as a, as a scientist. He never actually had a employment as a philosopher versus a kind of interesting life. Um, uh, he was always around in Harvard, but was never employed by Harvard. He thought he was a very eclectic and um, strange man. Um, this tradition sort of follows on, and I, I, I look at the method of arbitrary functions as part of this tradition that started with Poincaré, of course. It doesn't actually originate with Poincaré, but Poincaré gave it, I get its, its biggest and greatest extent. It's a way of finding out how to use probabilities to model phenomena that are not fundamentally indeterministic, but deterministic. And that's another way of answering this question without having to answer the question of ontology. So I think the method of arbitrary functions fits in nicely into the second tradition. And Reichenbach in his uh, doctoral thesis actually was devoted to Poincaré's method of arbitrary functions. Not a lot of people know that. He was engaged in that project too. Then he changed sites and moved on to a project in the interpretation of probability. So, so some authors sort of oscillate between these two projects, um, but I think the two projects are, are distinct. And I'd like to begin by inviting people to look at the methodology first and then deriving ontological consequences from that and not vice versa. So ontology, I flash it in red, um, meaning don't start there. Um, methodology, I flash it in green as I welcome to. Um, uh, this is a good place to start. Um, and I find that this debate has been very frustrating <laughs> on the whole. None of the interpretations of probability actually works. Um, well, this um, debate um, is a lot more fruitful, I think. And one can find lots of answers to even ontological questions when, when framed within this, this project. So this is a way to frame the project. I sort of begin with a study of a statistical model in practice. And this is something that I want to put to use today as well. So I'm going to start with looking at the way um, evolutionary biologists use fitness in their statistical models, as opposed to trying to answer the question, what fitness is in the abstract, and then applying that answer in order to figure out how we should use it in practice. Um, Okay, so the starting point, and this is also part of the view that I've defended for at least 10 years now, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Also because I've given talks about this in Paris and at the Institute uh, before, so some of you probably know this. Um, I sort of defend an extension of what I call Ramsey hacking pluralism, the sort of view defended by Frank Ramsey, also Rudolf Carnap, who famously divided probabilities into two kinds. and. Um, in a very characteristic Carnapian way, he named them probability sub one and probability sub two uh, with the indexes. As probability sub one is roughly 
as our understanding of subjective probability coincides with credences, um, a way of, sort of referring to um, partial degrees of belief probability sub two is our contemporary uh, concept of objective probability or chance. And both uh, distinguished the, these two concepts. Hacking famously argued that probability is a two sided concept, a genus faced concept with two distinct sides that are somehow intermingled. Um, what I want to do, what I've been doing in my work, is to extend this pluralism in the sense that I argue even the notion of objective probability or probability sub two is itself plural. That one also requires a division into not two, but three different or distinct concepts that need to be priced apart and kept distinct if we want to understand what statisticians and scientists do when they use statistical methods in modeling phenomena. So we're going to have to keep this. Sorry, I. So, sorry. That. That's not me, right? That wasn't coming from me. Yeah, good. Um, so we're going to have to keep theoretical propensities distinct from what I call formal or single case probabilities or, or, or single case chances. And that, again, keep it distinct from frequencies or frequency statistics, which I take to be finite features of experimental runs. Um, so this is the way that I'm going to keep these concepts distinct. And a lot of what I've been doing over the last 10 years is to argue that all philosophical attempts to reduce the one to the other of these three concepts, they all fail for both theoretical and practical reasons. So attempts to reduce probabilities to propensities, as in Popper's famous propensity interpretation of probability, fail. Um, attempts to reduce single case probabilities to frequencies, as in Vomises, and, and the logical empiricist uh, approach to objective probability also fail for reasons that are well known and widely discussed in the literature. And so you're going to need the three concepts in order to make sense of objective probability or chance. And the key question here is not so much to try to reduce these concepts, but to try to understand how they work in practice, in a statistical modeling practice, how they intermingle and mm -hmm. depend on each other. And they're interdependent in interesting ways. So this is the starting point for me. Um, the starting point is there are these three different um, notions. Um, and, and they are distinct in practice. So if we're going to ask questions about ontology, we'll have to ask questions about these three distinct notions, what they may refer to, and how they relate um, to each other. So the starting point is pluralistic. It's, uh, 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 if, you want, if you wanted to do the metaphysics of probability, the starting point would be a pluralistic metaphysics. I'm not very interested in metaphysical issues, but if I was interested in metaphysical issues, I would be beginning with this kind of metaphysical pluralism. And I think this has a clear um, reflection in, in practice, not just in a statistical model in practice, but even in ordinary practice about probability. Here are three examples which are discussed often in the literature of the philosophy of probability. And I think people don't often stop and think clearly what is it involved in these cases, but when you think a little bit about them, these three concepts are involved in distinct ways. So, a coin's propensity to land heads, and this is an example that is universally employed in the philosophy of probability. Popper constructed his whole propensity interpretation on account of this. You already can see how um, the concepts are distinct in this statement, which is a very um, useful or common way of putting um, the relationship between propensities and probabilities. The coin has a propensity to land heads with a certain probability. And then you can go on to test this by running experiments, by tossing the coin a number of times in ideal or um, particularly stable conditions, and then figuring out what the frequencies are in that experiment. And then you compare that probability with the frequencies and you test the statement. So if you think about it in this whole um, ex um, simple example that is used constantly in the probability literature, the three notions are prima facie distinct. The coin has certain propensities. These are properties that the coin is supposed to have. Then those propensities get manifested in certain probability distributions over possible events. The range of events are possible, are determined by the system and its propensities. And then that system sets or lays down some probabilities over that, those events. And then those are tested by looking at finite frequencies in 
actual experimental runs. And, and for me, all frequencies are finite and experimental. And I don't need to invoke ideal frequencies or, or, or hypothetical frequencies, which come with a heavy theoretical cost, but they're not needed in this schema. Um, the other two examples, I'm not going to discuss them here, but they have a very similar structure and you can talk about them in similar ways. Smoking's propensity to cause lung cancer with a certain probability. And again, that is tested by looking at um, um, the statistical variance of certain properties within certain populations and the subpopulations of smokers and non-smokers within. Um, so then there again, you have the propensity, which is a sort of theoretical property ascribed to a particular set of events, presumably responsive to some mechanisms that are, are, um, uh, are, are at play in the, in the human body when we subject it to smoking. Um, and then the, the certain probability that emerges from that, which is a manifestation of those propensities, uh, which can then be tested by means of frequencies. And I argue the same thing can goes through for, for the uh, ordinary examples of physics chancy experiments and systems such as uh, radioactive atoms propensity to decay with a certain probability. The half-life of the atom is the certain probability. And there's something about the structure of the radioactive atom that explains that half-life and gives rise to it. And then that can be tested by means of frequencies in experimental setup. So my, my argument here is this kind of pluralism that I'm arguing for is not really that revolutionary. It's, um, it's there in everyday parlance. And if you take the everyday parlance at, at the uh, face value, you're going to land in something that's very close to this pluralism. What's really contrary to, to ordinary everyday parlance is the attempt to reduce all of these notions into just one. All of these are frequencies or all of these are propensities. That seems to me to do more uh, violence to the ordinary way of talking about this um, in cases than, than the pluralism that I, that I defend. So, so this is my starting point and I'm not really going to argue for it. I have a lot of papers and if you want to look at the arguments in detail, I already gave you the two books where you can find them. But this is the starting point. I, I, I hold that this pluralism about objective probability is necessary to understand our notion of chance. We cannot really do away with any of these concepts. So the, the key is to apply this, this uh, tripartite conception of objective chance, I call it, to different cases of um, statistical modeling. Okay, so what I do in the rest of the talk is just apply this framework that I've described here to the case of evolutionary biology. And as it as turns out, I find out that it has a, a nice uh, application and that the, the field is a very hospitable um, area in which to apply these ideas. In fact, it's more hospitable than the uh, physics cases that I've been invoking for years where, um, where you have to do more work here. It's sort of the application comes even more naturally. So just a very, very quick summary of things that you all know. Um, the, this principle, this Darwinian principle of the survival of the fittest is supposed to provide some kind of explanatory framework for the extant and observed biological variation and diversity. Um, typically in the context of Darwin's um, theory and evolutionary biology in general inherits this from, from Darwin, you appeal to some sort of triad of heredity, mutation, and selection, always of the fittest as this explanatory framework. And the question here is what is this property fitness that is the one that is supposed to exercise a, the selective aspect of evolutionary biology and, and therefore explain, is capable of explaining um, variation and diversity as we observe it in, in real life. Well, intuitively, and this is an intuition that Darwin had and many have shared since then, and it still nowadays has many defenders. The fitness is, fitness is a property of individual organisms um, this then gets extended by different um, means um, to the application to, to genes in genetics and to, and to types or, or traits in other areas of evolutionary biology. But typically, many people still think the, the fitness and property of the organisms. And it's somehow related clearly to the capacity to reproduce and live offspring um, that are in turn capable of reproducing. So it has something to do with the expected a mature and functional offspring of an organism that are in, that are in turn capable of reproducing and therefore um, passing on the traits. And like here, the question is how to quantify, test, or empirically verify this capacity. Um, an empiricist answer through the years is that um, 
fitness is must be related to the observed offspring, perhaps over the long run or the long term. But if we are going to turn fitness into an empirical concept, it has to somehow relate to directly to our observations of the of the um, reproducing uh, capacities of the of the organisms, and that can only be by, by linking them to the observed um, results of of those um, organisms reproductive capacities. Now, obviously, there's here an, an evident looming circularity that all empiricist attempts to understand fitness have had to deal with in one way or another. If fitness is very intrinsically linked to observed offspring, then it cannot really explain in the way that it's supposed to in the Darwinian framework, the observed diversity, because um, they, they, that would be appealing to observed offspring in order to explain observe offspring um, of organisms. And that obviously would be circular as an explanation that would count for nothing. So at some point, the empiricist has to break the defender of fitness and who wants to claim that fitness is an empirical concept that can be um, related to empirical science has to break this looming circularity. And here's where probabilities often are brought into the rescue. And this is by evolutionary biologists themselves who have this understanding that fitness is very much a probabilistic concept. It's related to the expectation or the expected value of the reproducibility of organisms. Um, and typically often has been straightforwardly modeled as the expected value or expectation of some probability distribution over the offspring of an organism. Um, the expectation of some quantity O is given always by this formula. It's just an average in which you take the values, the possible values of this quantity O, multiply them by their probabilities as defined, and then just sum up. Um, whatever you get is the expected value or expectation, sometimes also called the mean value of a probability distribution over some quantity. So um, if you wanted to work out my, expect, just to make it clear that we all know what we're talking about, if you wanted to work out the, my expectation of winning the lottery, where the price is worth 1 million, when I have two tickets out of 1 million tickets, you would just precisely do this operation, calculate the sum over the product of the price money times the probability that my ticket be the winning ticket, then add up, that gets you here uh, two pounds or two euros. I don't know when we, I play lottery is always in, pound, in British pounds. I can't play lotteries in, in euros for some, some reason. <laughs> the compulsive gambling uh, tendency of the British, I guess. Um, so um, so that, that's the expected value for um, this probability distribution for me to win the lottery when I have two tickets and the prize money is one million. That's a, it's a very easy way to work out um, one, what is called the first statistical moment of any probability distribution um, for any quantity. Now, this is all very fine. And from an empiricist point of view, it's great because you're if you're going to identify fitness with the expected value of some probability distribution over the offspring of an organism, you get a precise quantifiable number that you can test easily against um, empirical tests. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to avoid the circularity that we're talking about, because the expectation of any quantity um, is really just a collection of this sum of products of probabilities over the observed values of some quantity O. Um, and so if you just let the experiment run and do the full experiment over all the observed values in accordance to the probabilities, you're just going to exactly recover that expectation value. So for instance, if I wanted to run the lottery uh, 2 million times, um, then my expectation, if um, the probabilities are correct, would just become my winnings. Um, I would just run these lotteries two million times. And indeed, in the long term, I would have spent so much money in buying all these tickets. I would have won so much money. And the expectation is exactly my winnings um, if the probabilities are right. So there is, there is a way in which this just doesn't get around the circularity at all. You're still trying to explain an observable feature of a probability distribution over offspring values by appealing to an observable feature, the mean or expected value of that probability distribution 
over the offspring uh, values. So, so you're still incurring in some kind of circularity. And here, the funders of propensity interpretations of fitness have found a reason to move over to a propensity account of probability, because obviously it's clear that the expectation is not going to get you out of this circularity. The, the first statistical moment of the distribution is just not going to give you the explanatory power that you seek. So people here have um, invoked propensities and the literature in evolutionary biology and the philosophy of biology um, is full of appeals to propensities in order to understand fitness, which is um, great for me because I, I do think propensities have a role to play. And while physicists are very um, um, unlikely to, and, and not very friendly to propensity talk in general, uh, it turns out that evolutionary biologists and philosophers of biology are. So you, you have to distinguish here, here very clearly two concepts. Um, the notion of a propensity from the generic notion of a disposition. A propensity is a probabilistic disposition, but it is important that it be understood as essentially indeterministic. And that's an important distinction between propensities and deterministic or surefire dispositions. In the case of deterministic or surefire dispositions, the manifestations of those dispositions are events. So for instance, if I um, ascribe solubility um, to sugar, to a um, um, cube of sugar that I put in my coffee, I'm saying that the solubility would be manifested in, this, in the dissolving of that cube of sugar when I put it in my coffee. That event is the manifestation of the dispositional property, solubility, or the fragility of my glass is manifested in the breakage of the glass when I hit it with sufficient force. That tells me it was fragile. Um, so, so deterministic dispositions are always manifested in events, while in deterministic or chancy dispositions, and there's a long literature here on this, uh, complex, but it sort of seems to agree on the fact that probabilistic or indeterministic dispositions, propensities, are manifested as probabilities over events. Not events, but probabilities over events. So if the coin toss is really indeterministic, it really is a propensity underlying it, then it will manifest itself in a probability, namely probability one half for heads, one half, one half for um, tails if the coin is, is fair. Uh, or a different kind of probability if the coin is not fair. That will uh, respond to the propensities of the coin. Um, the manifestation is a probability. The propensities are sort of the underlying properties of the system. Maybe not just the coin, but the coins, the coin in context, in the experimental context in which I toss it. And similarly for smoking and lung cancer and radioactivity, um, the properties of these systems, even in context, give rise to certain probabilities. In the case of radioactivity, the half-life of the atomic material. In the case of lung cancer, the, the rise in the probability that I may construct lung cancer if I'm a smoker. Um, so in all these cases, the dispositions are underlying pro pro uh, properties of the system, just as in the case of dispositions, of deterministic dispositions, but they are manifested via probabilities, um, which is not true in the case of deterministic or surefire dispositions. So sometimes, so here you have to be careful because sometimes we'll refer to dispositions as just deterministic surefire. Um, and they wouldn't call in deterministic or probabilistic um, dispositions. They wouldn't call them dispositions. I do. So I see them as both part of a larger family. There's this large family of dispositional notions or properties. Some of them are deterministic, some of them are not. Those that are not deterministic, we call propensities. Um, the others we call surefire dispositions, deterministic dispositions. Uh, but people sometimes refer to deterministic or surefire dispositions as dispositions and nothing else. And you see that in, for instance, Stephen Mumford's early work, where all dispositions are deterministic. Um, okay, so the idea here is use this propensity account in order to get out of the looming circularity with fitness and, and th that you land in when you use the expected value um, account of fitness. Um, and, and the question is whether you can use coherently this interpretation of fitness as a propensity, um, a probabilistic disposition that, that manifests itself in some way as a, as a probability. Um, in, and here you see nowadays there's this big divide in the field. There are people who, who are called causalists 
uh, either they refer to themselves as causalists or those who are not causalists call them causalists more likely. And then there are people who refer to themselves as statisticalists or defenders of a statisticalism, um, which I think would be happier to refer to themselves as a statisticalists. Um, and, the, and, and there's a division. And the division really concerns whether fitness is a causally explanatory concept. Causalists think, yes, it is um, an explanatory concept. It doesn't fall into the circularity and moreover it explains by causal means. A statisticalist think, no, you cannot get out of the circularity. Um, fitness is not really a causally explanatory concept. It is explanatory concept, but in the sense of being a generalization, sort of generalization of a statistical kind, of providing a sort of a statistical summary of happenings. And in that sense, in which a generalization can explain its instances, fitness may be said to be explanatory, but not in any other stronger causally, causal way. I've put a number of the papers that are sort of classics by now in this field here, some of them with some hesitation because I think people do oscillate between these two camps quite a lot. But um, there's an early paper by Ronald Fisher, which is really quite a gem, particularly because he has such a clear concept of what um, indeterministic causation amounts to. At a time in 1934, where very few people really understood the notion of indeterministic causation. Um, so he is clearly a causalist. Um, Susan Mills and James Petty wrote this very famous influential paper, a propensity interpretation of fitness work in 1979, where they defended that fitness was a propensity and a causally explanatory concept. Um, although then later on, Betty and Finson, um, Finson is Susan Finson, who changed her name, I think, I guess she called uh, Marit. Um, um, then um, 10 years later, they took they took that concept out. Um, so, so were they, where they were defending the propensity interpretation of fitness, they sort of problematized it hugely 10 years, 10 years on. And nowadays, I don't think they would be defenders of the propensity interpretation of fitness. Um, and then there's Sandra Ariu and Dennis Walsh and Mohan Mathen who have been um, tirelessly arguing for statisticalism and against the causalist understanding of fitness. They really claim there's no causal explanatory concept there. And they think the circularity is inescapable. Um, you cannot really employ this pro probability notions without incurring in some circularity that uh, de devoids or deprives you of any um, causal power of an explanatory kind. Uh, Roberta Milstein has been trying to argue for a, um, a cause, a fitness as a causal explanatory concept as well. Um, I, I hesitate to put here Isabel and and Francesca, because I think they, they also, I think they may differ amongst themselves a little bit um, about this. Um, but I, I, I think they, their paper does criticize the propensity interpretation of fitness and the idea of fitness as a, as a causal explanatory concept in this way, but they have an other ways of figuring, of understanding fitness that um, I think they think um, satisfies their requirements of causalism. So it's a complex position. So I mentioned some of these are, difficult to classify. Um, Sober himself is complex because he now thinks straight fitness, as you can see in the title of this last paper, is a propensity and is a causal explanatory concept, but fitness variation is, is not, and fitness variation is a property of organisms. So he's moved uh, a long way from his um, earlier work. So anyway, there's this big debate here about <clears throat> whether fitness can be properly understood to be a propensity concept and therefore, to be said to be causally explanatory and it gets you out of the circularity or whether it, it cannot be understood in these ways and it cannot get you out of the circularity. Um, what I want to do is rather focus, I'm not going to address this huge debate, which has lots of ramifications, it's really complex. I'm just gonna concentrate on two particular problems with the, and technical problems as well, with the propensity interpretation of fitness. And I'm going to have to do this a bit quickly um, but you find in my paper all the details about, about this. Uh, at some point, I'll have to flash some of these results past you a bit quickly. You can ask me in the question time and we can come back. Um, so my claim is that the traditional propensity interpretation of fitness cannot really solve either of these two problems. And the critics are right. Um, the statisticalists have been using these problems to argue against the propensity interpretation of fitness. But then I argue if you apply this pluralism, this complex nexus of chance, which is a pluralistic 
um, framework, then you can solve these problems. And then you can see how fitness could be a causally explanatory power in the, in the appropriate way without falling into the circularity. So let me concentrate quickly on the moments problem. Do this quite quickly. This has to do with the fact that uh, probability distributions don't just have one moment. The, the expected value is just one of the moments of a probability or, or features of a probabilistic distribution. It's actually the simplest one, what's called the, the, the first moment of a probability distribution. But you can find out higher moments by squaring the differences between the observed properties and their mean values. And, and those of you who've done some statistics, you will know this, of course, very well. Um, there's the dispersing of the probability distribution, which is akin to the, to the um, variance and, and, and uh, uh, um, the square root of the standard deviation. And then if you go to the third power, you find the skewness, and you can even ho go higher than this. And you can find, and there's in fact an indefinite number of moments for any statistical distribution. And here, uh, biologists have discovered something very interesting, which is that the probability distribution for offspring for many organisms has this peculiar feature that as you go higher up in the moments of the distribution, you get interesting reversals of the expected value. So if you have two organisms with the same expected value, the organism that has the probability distribution for offspring with a smaller dispersion or variance will typically be fitter than the one who, that has the larger variance or dispersion. And this can be to the point that it can trump differences in expected value. So you have an organism with a higher expected value for successful offspring than another one, but the other one has such a large, such a small variance that it trumps the first one and becomes the fittest one in the long term. Um, so this is, why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because typically you identify the propensity interpretation with some moment of the statistical distribution. The fitness is, the propensity that underlies the expected value of the probability distribution. But it turns out that there are higher moments that trump that in terms of fitness. So actually you cannot identify fitness with just the first moment of the distribution. And then it happens for this person too, as you go up to a skewness, you can have um, higher skewness, that um, positive skewness that trumps um, uh, lower variance. So again, you, ha you have the same phenomenon there. So basically what you have here is, two distributions with the same expected value, but the one with the, with the smaller variance um, or, or this person is fitter. Um, or if you go to a skewness, you have three probability distributions for three, three different organisms. They all have the same median, the same mean expected value. Um, they may even have the same dispersion, but one of them has positive skew and that one will be fitter. Um, so, higher moments of the probability or statistical distribution for offspring are really relevant, can be relevant for the fitness of the organism. So you cannot identify um, fitness with just one of the moments of the statistical distribution. You have to try to understand them all. And, and that tells you something about not simply in, interpreting the probability distribution, but doing something else to figure out what's fitness. Fitness is not just merely a probability distribution suitably interpreted. But it's going to be it's going to be more uh, than that. This is compounded by the other problem, which is called the delay selection problem, um, and and this is a problem well known in the literature, um, both in evolutionary biology and the philosophy of biology, which is that long term fitness can also trump offspring value in the short term. Um, so what do I mean by this? Um, and this is this is distinct from the problem of moments, which just concerns one statistical distribution and the different moments of that one distribution. This concerns two different distributions for the offspring or reproducibility value of the same organism. One considers short term down the descendants line, that is just the immediate descendants of the organism, the children, the distribution over the children, the number of children that the organism may have. Um, and the other one consider much more long run or long term down the descendancy line, considering grandchildren, great grandchildren, and so on down the generations. And the organism that, can, that may be fitter short term may not be the fittest long term. This is going to be very sensitive, in fact, to changes in the environment and resources. And you can see clearly why. If you're living in an environment where suddenly resources become very scarce, having only one child 
may be advantageous to the survival of that child because you can protect it and feed it better than if you have two or three where they may all die because of the division of resources. So in the long term, it may be more beneficial in the short term to have fewer children. So mm, less, uh, uh, a shorter fitness, smaller fitness in the short term may lead to longer fitness, um, short, uh, bigger fitness in the long term. And this is well known amongst evolutionary biologists and particularly geneticists have, and try to understand how this works along um, the lines of population genetics and down the, 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 the line of the, the descendancy line. Okay, so this again has problems because for the propensity interpretation of fitness, because remember the propensity interpretation associates propensities just to an interpretation of probability and, and identifies probabilities with, with, with those propensities. And now you have to choose whether you're gonna choose the short-term distribution or the long-term distribution. They cannot both be the probability that gets interpreted by means of propensity in order to answer the puzzle of, of fitness and the, and the looming circularity. So this is a problem generated by the underdetermination of the statistical distribution. So it's not looking at the different moments of the same distribution, but the fact that you can have different distributions representing somehow short and longer term fitness for the same organism. Um, and you may think, well, you can solve this problem because really only long-term fitness is relevant. Um, and people have, been, um, have had the tendency to do this and then to identify long-term fitness with long-run propensities. Um, but I, there are lots of problems here. How long is long-term? Um, and there are known cases of, of reversals of fitness very farther down the line, not immediately at the second generation, but farther uh, down the line. So where do you put the long? it may not be long enough. Um, and also short-term fitness, even immediate-term fitness has a lot of uses in biological um, modeling practice. Sometimes you really are just interested in how many immediate um, offspring the organisms will have in, 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 the, in the context in hand. So it seems wrong to just reject the idea of short-term fitness altogether. And then there are other attempts to try to define limits. Um, a Charles Spencer Grant Ramsey have a really interesting paper um, on this. I think it, it, they also have some technical and conceptual problems. Uh, I think a better response altogether would be to accept that all short-term and long-term distributions for offspring for an organism are relevant to its fitness. Just um, in context, they represent something different about the property of fitness of that organism. So you have to take them all on board. And you can't do that if you just simply consider fitness to be um, one probability distribution interpreted correctly as a propensity, which is what the literature often has tried to do. And it has tried to do this because it has followed Popper in which I think is, is a mistaken thesis, the so-called identity thesis, which I, I call it, and I criticize Popper for it. Just Popper's idea that the problems of, um, the problems of quantum mechanics and other senses would just disappear if you interpret probability right, and to interpret it right is to interpret it as a propensity. And so therefore you should identify probabilities with propensities. And that Popper thought would solve the problems of quantum mechanics. Um, it didn't solve them at all. Many of us, many of us have been arguing for years that, that the problems persist. Um, because in the end, um, propensities are not really just in the business of interpreting probabilities. This is just to be part of the first tradition into the quest for the ontology or truth makers of the probability statements. But if you're starting from a methodological point of view, what you want to do is to use the plurality that I spoke to at the beginning in order to understand um, scientific modeling practice. And, and their propensities are involved in an attempt to explain probabilities rather than simply interpret them. So what I advocate is using this complex plural nexus of chance in order to understand fitness. And what that means is that you countenance and accept that objective chance has three parts, propensities, single case probabilities and frequencies, and they are not reducible. So no identity thesis is valid on this account. And so chance really uh, is begging you to ask questions about the dispositional properties. In the case of fitness, if we're going to identify fitness with this complex nexus of chance and construct something like complex nexus of evolutionary fitness, that's asking questions about the dispositional properties of organisms. 
to be deployed within certain environments. But then there will be distinct probability distributions, which represent the single case chances of these organisms. Each of them manifesting these propensities and manifest them differently in different contexts. So short-term fitness is one thing, long-term fitness is another, even longer-term fitness is another. They're all manifestations of the same underlying properties of the organism manifested differently in different contexts. And finally, you check that against the frequency data of observed values and the expected value that you calculate from the observations. These are distinct. You cannot aim to identify them all, and you should not identify fitness with any one of them either. You have to identify fitness with a complex nexus of the three. Fitness is a bit of everything in this, in this approach. Um, and that's the key. And this will solve the problems. It's also a moment's problem question because you don't identify propensities with any one of the moments of any particular statistical distribution. Fitness is all the moments of all the statistical dis distributions understood in context. And, and then you also solve the delay selection problem for the same, in the same way by refusing to identify fitness with one particular statistical distribution of the organism, whether it be short or long term. And fitness on this account, but you cannot identify it with any statistical moment or, or with um, any of the, of the um, statistical distributions of the organism in context. Okay, so what is fitness then? Well, on this account, um, it's all of these things. Fitness is the complex nexus of all these three notions and their interrelation in practice. It is the propensities or underlying pro probabilistic dispositions, properties of the organisms, maybe in their environment, which in turn may also have its own dispositions and propensities, and they may interact in complex ways. Um, and then they get manifested in a certain probability distribution of their offspring or reproducibility values, but not just one, but many probability distributions in different contexts. So the same organism place it in a different environment. It will manifest its propensities in a different way by means of different probability distributions. Those are also part of the fitness of the organism and then the frequency data that it gives rise to. So no identification fitness with any of this will do. And that's the, that's the claim. And my, my just looking ahead, my idea would be to try to apply this more generally to try to solve the problem of the dispute between causalists and statisticalists. Um, and this is a project that is I'm just embarking on, and of course, a much larger project, but you see how it would go. Basically, both are actually right. Statisticalists are right that the mere statistical distributions of our offspring values, and, and not, not, not to mention their moments, whether the first, second, or third moment, they're bereft of causal powers and can by themselves not explain causally anything. These are the ones that fall into the circularity trap because they are just mere summaries of these distinct manifestations. But then causalists are right that fitness is more than just merely the statistical distributions that summarize these data. Fitness is a complex nexus of properties involving also this underlying propensities, which are causally explanatory properties of the organisms. Um, but you cannot understand them merely as probability, rather they give rise to probability distributions in different contexts. So if you understand them properly, you would see that the relation between the causal explanatory part of fitness and the statistical summary of fitness is not one of identification, but rather they, they must be kept distinct. So in a way they're both right. And, and the, the problem here is that each of them is focusing on one aspect of fitness and claiming that one aspect is the whole of fitness. And that's what's giving rise to the debate. And in that identification, exclusionary identification, they're both in a way right, wrong because fitness is not just the statistical distributions and fitness is not just the underlying propensities or properties of the organisms. It's, it's really the complex interrelation of all of them in context. So that's all. Uh, the paper is up there for you to look at when I develop these arguments in detail. And there are more arguments as well as the ones that I've described here. And I'll be very happy to receive your comments and questions now. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mauricio. And by the way, we can stop the recording now if you want to have the discussion.
So thank you, Cyril. It's up to you. Okay. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you see the slides? Okay. Fine. Maybe I should enlarge. Try mm -hmm. to enlarge the slides as much as possible. Okay. So it's thirty-six. Uh, take no. Take no more than one hour. Okay. So thank first. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to discuss the issue of uh, computer simulations with people, especially in France, which we don't do regularly. Uh, so the title has, of course, changed. This one is just uh, even larger. So the general question I want to investigate here is how simulations relate to other sources of content and knowledge. And in particular, because one part of the question is quite obvious concerning how they relate to theories. And so I want to investigate now in particular how much simulation can be empirical. And so just Robert, Robert thinks is going to, the final claim is that simulation are just like epistemic suspense. I'll try to explain this later. Okay, so um, there are various sources of knowledge, experiments, theories, simulations, for experiments. So various types of sources and epistemic activities that produce knowledge. And also it's totally legitimate as is done in uh, classical epistemology to try to investigate how these different activities that do produce knowledge relate to each other and how they can cross feed each other. And the a natural question is, is it possible eventually to represent in simple, informative and non-misleading ways these relationships between these activities? And can we assume that there are general matter of facts that can be represented in, in this way? So what I'm going to try to the claims I'm going to try to defend is that simulations are derived sources of knowledge, but they are epistemologically, epistemologically neutral in the sense that they can be fed by almost any other source of knowledge. So not mainly just theories. And so in particular, that they can almost be entirely be fed by uh, experiments that computational models can be almost you know, entirely fed by experiment. So then the question is, so what is the kind of knowledge that is produced by simulations? So eventually is it just empirical knowledge, which is um, kind of maybe uh, unpalatable. Okay, um, then I, so I'm going to, uh, to try to argue that at the end of the day, simulations are epistemologically heterogeneous in the sense that uh, different simulation from an epistemological point of view are fed very different places of the work in very, very, very uh, different epistemologic ways. So be careful about uh, general um, claims about simulations. And one, so I, I'll argue in particular, but in many cases, uh, we don't distinguish, distinguish sufficiently between a simulation as types, as epistemologic types that we analyze, and it's legitimate to analyze for some questions. And in some of the cases, we all just have claims about uh, token simulations, and we should clearly distinguish much more sharply between these uh, different levels of analysis. Okay. And, and, and I cannot move the slides, which is carrying. Oh, oh, okay. So here's the plan of the talk. So first, I'm going to describe, well, the state of the art. Then I'll emphasize that the notion of source of knowledge, which is a, which is a notion that has been developed by a mainstream classical epistemologists, is very useful in this context. And I'll discuss briefly some examples by Mary Morgan. Then I go further and it will be the core of the discussion about how much dynamics, uh, computer dynamics of computational model be given by, uh, by data. And finally, I, I'll try to conclude. Okay. So first, uh, some, some background. So first, the, what have, has to be kept in mind in fact for decades, mainstream epistemologists and philosophers of science were unable to see what was novel with uh, models and simulations in particular. So simulations were more or less uh, equated with particular cases of modeling activities and modeling activities were just theoretical activities. So I would say till the ages. So clearly it was an, an image to be uh, corrected. And this has been done after the eighties by philosophers, pioneers uh, investigations about models 
and simulation. So first they had to claim that clearly there was something novel here and that um, analysis of models and simulation did not reduce to either the theoretical sphere nor to that of the experimental uh, sphere. And so for the better and the worse, uh, this investigation was carried out as something new that require, required um, novel tools, basically. So just by pushing aside uh, existing tools in uh, uh, mainstream epistemology and philosophy of science. And I think it's led to um, inadequate claims. So typically then the claim that, okay, if this is something novel, so it cannot be equated to experiments or theories. And since for various purposes, you know, a philosopher of science tried to describe uh, scientific activities with, as a, with a bipolar schemes where you have theories on the one hand, experiments on the other, and then you're going to create diagrams or conceptual uh, sketches in which you describe activities. And maybe, and maybe for, for some purposes, okay, this is clearly an idealization, but for some purposes, maybe absolutely adequate. The question is here whether it's uh, really adequate. So what philosophers did in the 90s were to say, look, simulations are somewhere, um, should be located on this map. And so there were many claims uh, to the effect that um, simulations and models were somewhere in between theories and experiments. So more or less, we are, they were drawing maps or implicit maps of science and trying to bipolar maps of science. So with two main sphere, experimental and theoretical, and then you, you needed to try to locate uh, simulations and model some, somewhere on this map. And clearly these pictures were on the one hand from a heuristic point of view, very stimulating, but uh, naturally they were very much inadequate and ill-conceptualized. And so unsurprisingly, a uh, rigorous philosopher of science like Frigg and Rice uh, had more or less uh, fun just trying to criticize all these claims uh, by emphasizing that these maps were uh, ill-conceptualized, misleading, that there are many different uh, issues to be distinguished between, uh, typically ontological issues, semantical issue, methodological issue, and epistemological issues, and that this was not uh, legitimate. So I think that it was totally a legitimate criticism and that it just uh, highlighted the lack of maturity uh, of the field. In addition, I think that uh, drawing from the start, uh, this kind of representation uh, is very misleading because then there are going to be assumptions that are implicit built in the, in the representation. Typically, you have experiments, you have theories, so simulations have to be somewhere else, somewhere else on the map. And if you're somewhere else on the map, it means you probably have different roles, if it involves different activities, different features. And then, so you are different from experiments or, or theories, which in one sense is, is correct, but it's also misleading because, for example, here I want to argue that simulations can be more or less on the same spot as experiments on, uh, for, for, for some questions. Uh, so I think this, this maps of science just are implicit assumptions that you have to, but first, that the, the, you are going to locate somewhere an activity somewhere on the map, and then by locating the same activity somewhere on a hub, so sorry, I have a four, uh, um, then there is also this assumption about the fact that these activities are more or less homogeneous. I mean, you put them somewhere on the map and then you have coordinates that describe uh, the, these activities as types. And I think here again, it's legitimate because uh, I, I'm, uh, for many issues, I think that simul simulations are not homogeneous as uh, activities. Uh, so the upshot is that if we want to use these conceptual sketches are clearly useful in general, but we need to focus much more sharply on particular questions, which I'm going to do now. And so I'm going to focus just on the question of how simulations can be fed by other sources of, of knowledge. And for this, so I'm going to try to, to, to start from scratch again, more or less, by using existing traditional conceptual tools in epistemology. And at the end of the day, we'll see if we are able to elaborate some more specific uh, maps to summarize things. So this is the second part. So I'm going to build on the conceptual framework of uh, sources of knowledge, which is, sorry for that, uh, which uh, were developed by, for example, typically by uh, philosophers like uh, Robert, uh, epistemologists like uh, Robert Odie. So a uh, source of knowledge, 
oral justification is roughly something in the lives of the knower, such as perception or reflection, that you yields beliefs constituting knowledge. So there are many different types of sources, memory, reason, testimony, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here I emphasize from the start that you may use this framework just from uh, as an instrumentalist. I mean, you don't need to buy claims about the nature of knowledge. You don't have to be very typically a uh, foundationalist to use this conceptual framework of sources of knowledge. I mean, there are sources of knowledge, some things that do produce knowledge, and it's just a legit, uh, legitimate uh, question. Sorry. It is, it's just a normal question just to try to analyze to, uh, to, to, to this. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So it's, it's just a legitimate question to try to analyze these different uh, sources of knowledge. So there's not necessarily a commitment to foundational positions. So question, how do simulations relate to other sources of uh, knowledge? Uh, to go further on this question, you also need to uh, distinguish between basic sources of knowledge and derived sources of knowledge. So I put the definition here, but basically for a basic source of knowledge, you don't need anything else that is going to be essential. Uh, for derived sources of knowledge, you need something as an input. Typically, when you, you take uh, arguments, you need to, to feed the arguments with premises that, are, and that come from other sources of knowledge, and you are going to make something out of these premises. Similarly, for memory, memory can hardly work on its own. I mean, you, you need to have other sources of knowledge that are going to feed memory, and then memory can rescue these um, uh, pieces of knowledge. So here, clearly, simulation seems to be uh, uh, derived sources of knowledge that are fed by other sources of knowledge to describe initial conditions, to create a model, and they are going to produce something. Okay. Um, another distinction is because we only say there are very sources, sources of what? And here, so usually the distinction is between sources of knowledge and sources of justification. Here, I, I want to be more specific and say there are sources of content, so the content of the beliefs, what fuels so the beliefs that you may have, and you may also have sources of justification. So what, where does justification uh, come from? So sources of justification are what provide uh, warrants for endorsing beliefs. Okay, and clearly sources of content and sources of justification are potentially distinct, even if in many cases, uh, so the same activities provide both. Typically, when you have an experiment, the exp experiment provides the data, and you're also going to trust the data because they are from an empirical source. So the experiments are both sources of content and sources of justification. But the two roles and corresponding questions are distinct. You may have things that provide content and other, and other sources that uh, provide justifications. So typically an example, uh, successful aging or the well entrenchedness of practices or model may be a source of justification, but it doesn't provide content at all. I mean, having something that is old does not, I mean, oldness does not give uh, content. So the two are clearly distinct. And so here I just want to focus about the sources of content of simulations. And typically for analysis about the, uh, how simulations are justified, about the warrants of simulation. You may have a look at Anouk and Marion uh, paper in, in synthesis in 2014. So I'm just going to focus about sources of content that may feed simulations and not any kind of simulation actually. I mean, simulations that do provide uh, knowledge. Um, third, Another very useful distinction is that between preservative source of knowledge, that is uh, sources of knowledge that just don't change anything. So typically memory, I mean, you put something in your memory and then later your memory is going to give it back to you. Okay, so there is nothing that is added. So this is a preservative source, source of knowledge. So anything can clearly, any source of knowledge can clearly feed a, a preservative source of knowledge because there is no change in, in the content. And you also have generating, generative sources of knowledge, which is sources of knowledge for which fall, but produce additional knowledge, okay? And clearly simulations seem to be of this type because simulation do 
produce something beyond and above the initial model. So we have generative sources of knowledge. And so for generative sources of knowledge, a legitimate question is, OK, so how do these um, sources need to be feed to be able to generate something, uh, something more, some novel pieces of knowledge? I'm going to skip this. Um, so this is no the general frameworks so or simulations. The question is, how? Oh, so how can they be fed? And to answer this question, one needs to go deeper in what simulations are. So I've written here a sketch of a definition of simulation. So the crucial point for those of you who are not familiar with these techniques is that when you do a simulation, you are going to make a representation of the evolution of a system. And what is crucial is going, you are going to generate by computational means a step-by-step -step description, not of the system in general, but one of its trajectories in the state space. So you have a model of the system, a representation of the system that describes all its potential uh, um, uh, states. And then the purpose of the simulation is to see how the system is going to evolve from one state to another. So you're going to see how it evolves in what can be called its state space. And the computational model is what is going to uh, make this possible. So when, with this definition, I just want to emphasize that first, you don't generate any kind of knowledge. So it's not any kind of activity. So it's generative knowledge, but you crucially need to be able to make this transition from one state to another. So there's a crucial role of the dynamical model. And this is where it's legitimate to wonder, to wonder about what can, which, which type of information of our ingredient is needed to ca carry out this role of describing the transition from one state to another. So which sources of information and of knowledge can provide this information to, for, for, for simulations? OK, so this is where we need to, to go further in the examples to try to answer the question. Given that naturally, a theory can provide this, this type of, of information. Naturally, a theory in general, where well, if you come back to the definitions about theory, they are precisely going to describe how systems evolve in their uh, state space. So for theories, clearly the answer is yes, a theory can fit a simulation, but it's not because theory can fit simulation, but we know what can fit simulation in general. So the legit, uh, an interesting question to see how, which other sources can do this and can experiments provide the required uh, material. So uh, third, third step, um, examples, because in general, so this is a general question I, I've described, and then you may try to answer the, the question by general arguments, but uh, exploring actual cases systematically, and here the emphasis, in, emphasis is uh, on systematically, can also be uh, very useful. Just to try to span uh, all the poten potential cases and see what can actually be the case. Because, and this is a <laughs> kind of personal experience in many practice and cases, I mean, uh, actual scientific cases just go far beyond what as philosophers were able to imagine. So general arguments are good, but um, just investigating all potential cases is also useful. And someone who has kind of pioneered this method for models and simulation is Mary Morgan. So Mary Morgan has tried to investigate in particular how you could have experiments with environmental intervention. And so for this, she has tried to investigate um, kind of weird cases, unusual cases, in which you had some kind of mix between experiments and uh, computational activities. So here, I don't want to describe what hybrids may be or what material means. I just want to emphasize what she has done by focusing on very, by just trying to, yes, to, to, to describe the the, the, the span or the potential space of cases that you may have. And so investigating weird cases, even if they are rare, because from a conceptual point of view, investigating rare cases can learn you many things. If you just go to traditional, usual uh, cases, you may not have this. So it's less interesting for the conceptual exploration. So our main example is the, the, um, the bone case uh, in which she, she described how scientists from our university 
uh, have created a kind of computational bone. So it was, well, decades ago, so maybe it's just, it's less fascinating now, but still. So what scientists has done is they just take actual bones, real bones, and they make slices of it. Then they make picture of the slides just to know where the bonish substance, bonish stuff is. And so eventually when you add the different uh, picture and you have a kind of virtual uh, numerical bone. And with this, so it creates a representation of the bone, which is clear. And creating this representation clearly mixes experimental and computational procedures. And then when you have that, you're going to try to see how this uh, representation evolves. And in particular, how difficult it is and in which cases the bone can be uh, broken. And so this is one of the kind of unusual cases that she described as very empirical in which you have a, a model, but the model is clearly fed by empirical uh, sources. And this is one of the reasons why she described this as kind of a numerical, why this is one was the reason why she described this as being in between um, um, experiments and uh, numerical and computational objects. Okay, so, the problem I think with, uh, uh, so from a methodological point of view, I'm totally enthusiastic. So problem that she tries to make, to use this example to write general typologies. And uh, as you can see, I mean, these typologies are very difficult to understand uh, at the end of the day. And in addition, I mean, when she does this, I think that she does different things at the same time. She tries to describe how much models can be uh, empirical, how much they can be material, and she also tries to uh, relate these questions to questions about reliability. So why these models are going to be reliable. So I think personally there's, there are too many questions at the same time. Uh, yes, and there's also the question of, of the issue of uh, hybrid activities. What hybrid activities are, are they possible? In which sense you have hybrids? So it's one and once again, another question that is prompted by our very interesting example. So what I want to do is, is instead is just to focus on one particular part, which is how much simulations can be empirical and try to do this uh, more systematically. Because one of the main reasons for my dissatisfaction with her example is that at the end of the day, if you step back, I mean, there is nothing very empirical in her in her cases because what the experiments are used for is just basically to describe the geometry of the bone. So you just make the slices, you take pictures, and it more or less describe describes um, yes the geometry of the bone. And if you just step back and say, well, for ordinary simulation, this is just uh, something usual. It's just that in these particular cases, the initial so, so the geometry of the system was very difficult to, 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 to know, and you had to carry out uh, intensive experimentation to do this. But I mean, for ordinary systems, it's just usual. I mean, the, the geometry of the system is just given by empirical knowledge. Full stop, if you just simulate the Earth, okay, clearly you need a map of the Earth and it's going to be given experimentally. And while well, you're not going to say that a climate simulation of the Earth are very empirical for this reason, I mean, come on. So, and so this is the first, first thing. So from a conceptual point of view, I think the example is not convincing at all. And the second reason that is that at the end of the day, the dynamics of the model, I mean, the, of the, of the, how uh, the, the, the strains on the bone are just given by the ordinary law of uh, classical mechanics. So basically it's just a model of, well, that is built on classical um, uh, laws of mechanics in which you are, by unusual procedures, you have described a boundary initial and general conditions and the geometry of the system. So the question is, okay, it's stimulating, but can we do better? And in particular, try to have cases in which the, the core of the model, the dynamic core of the model is given uh, empirically, truly empirically. So this is what I want to do and to discuss in uh, the third part uh, of this talk, uh, the fourth part of this talk. Okay, um, so I come back to the initial question. So what are the usual sources of content to carry out simulation? So it's by sources of content, I mean, what gives the logical description of simulations? So it can be experiments, can be theories, can be mathematics. In many cases, models and simulations heavily draw on mathematics. There may also be convention, arbitrary choices, 
Um, so all the sources kind of in comp feed computational model. So here I'm just going to focus about uh, how experiments can fit in computational model. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that here I'm just focusing on simulation models that are able to provide uh, actual knowledge of the world. Because in one sense, well, as soon as you just invent uh, fictional worlds, my fictional sort of models can just be fed with, with anything. So the, the key question is when you have simulations that do provide knowledge about the world, uh, how much can they be fed? And so you just put aside all the issue of just purely fictional uh, models, okay? So how much empirical simulations can be? So then I just list, need to list all the different ingredients in, uh, in simulation. So you have initial conditions. So clearly this can be empirical. I will not discuss that. Boundary condition, same thing. Geometry of the investigating system, same thing. And then at the end, you have the dynamical core of the model. So we already know that in many cases, the dynamic core of the model can be fed by empirical sources. So you have things about, for example, empirical calibration when you tune up parameters, which is something that is quite uh, usual. But when you do this, usually it's just uh, empirical input is there at the margin. And but you may also say you have phenomenolog phenomenological models in general, for example, in climate models, uh, uh, cloud formation is usually uh, described by, ph by a phenomenological model. Right. Question, is it possible to get things that are even more empirical than this? Um, the problem then, and then we come to more uh, serious uh, obstacles and uh, concerning this possibility because to carry out the simulations, so one needs to know at each time and for each component, what the general dynamics of the simulation implies locally. So how locally you have transition from one state to another. And usually, uh, this is given by some nomological statements that usually takes an, uh, that need to take an algorithmic form because you have a computational model that describes how for all possible cases the system evolves from one state to another. And arguably this covers an infinity, an infinite number of cases and clearly experiments cannot per se provide this nomological statements. Okay, so it seems to be a dead hand. So, to try to overcome this dead hand, I want to describe the different reasons why we have a strong intuition that experiments cannot provide the nomological core of the model. And I want to try to then to answer all the different objections, even either with arguments or with more examples. So first argument is the problem of the form of the model. I mean, the form of the model, uh, basically it's a mathematical function. So it has a functional forms and well, experiments do not provide uh, functions. So this is the first reason because of the form of the model, it doesn't, it seems to be impossible for an experiment to provide just a mathematical function. A second argument is about the quantity of information that is needed. Because so as I emphasized earlier, a computational model covers an you know, almost infinite number of cases. Uh, imagine you just discretize the laws of uh, physics. So it covers an infinite number of cases, or at the very least, a very large number of cases, because then things are discretized. So actually, the phase space has a uh, limited size. So basically, it grows exponentially. But experiments are finite, so they clearly cannot provide this. A uh, third problem, there is a prediction issue. Simulations involve making predictions from particular state over the evolution of the system towards the future of potential states. And clearly experiments do not license this because experiments just describe matter of fact. So arguably they cannot describe, provide the computational model. And more generally, so this is a refinement to the former, there is the issue of extrapolation and projection issue. You need to know to for a simulation uh, to determine from one particular state how things are going to uh, take place in for all the values of uh, of the of the of the parameters and well usually experiments cannot provide all these values uh, for all all potential uh, state of the system so you need clearly at one state one hour to have something that enables you to to, to make a simulation to extrapolate from what you have to what is going to be the case so 
Okay, so I've tried to list it four arguments and now I'm going to try to answer them. So there is first a question about the, uh, the form argument. A computational models need to be provided in a functional form describing mathematically the relationships between input and outputs and experiments do not provide this. Well, actually this is not exactly true because in many cases you don't need a general functional form, a mathematical form, and in many cases just having a graph, just delivering the graph is totally sufficient. So, I mean, the form argument is a bad argument. So here, are, and in general, naturally you're going to, to need a mathematical function because you need to describe an infinite number of cases and you are not able to provide an infinite uh, a graph of infinite size. So clearly this is a reason why in many cases continuous mathematical functions are crucial, but in many cases you don't need that. And for you are able to do simulations with just by providing the graph. So here I've put two examples. So for example, is just a cellular automata rule in which, so rule 110 involves some classification. I describe a very simple dynamics and it's the dynamics is provided extensionally. Okay, so you don't have a general function. Well, you just have all the list of potential cases. So naturally, it's a very simple example, but you may have much more elaborate uh, simulation in which it's totally work. And here I have put uh, such a description of the of the dynamics of a model in which the dynamics is once again uh, delivered and described extensionally, where you just describe all the potential cases for interactions. So here, this is in the right uh, of the screen. It's about the description of the dynamics of uh, LGCA. So it's once again, it's a cellular automata. It's not any cellular automata. It's a cellular automata, but it's sufficient to describe the, um, basically the behavior of fluids and gases. Uh, and so with this very simple uh, hexagonal model, so here what is listed is uh, all the potential so it's a discrete gas, so you have particles that move on in discrete grids, and what is, what is described here is all the potential co collisions between particles. And here again, there is no general rule, uh, just a, a list, a finite list of potential uh, cases. So um, this means that in some cases, I don't say in all cases, clearly we don't need general uh, mathematical functions with a general form and just describing the graph will do. So it comes to us, it, it brings us uh, closer to uh, something that maybe uh, can be delivered by an uh, experiment. Second thing, well, there is a, the argument of the quantity of information that is needed. So, well, if you just see so this finite description of dynamics, it more or less answers uh, the, uh, the the objections because you in in such cases a very very little information is needed to describe the dynamics so a very little information is so and this is finite information so if this is finite information well there is no reason why it could not be delivered by finite data so by experiments so i think once again the quantity of information argument is a, a bad argument so this will not prevent us from just uh, elaborating uh, purely empirical simulations. Um, and then if we come back to actual cases, well, this is often the case, actually. This is often the case. In many cases, we don't have a theory. We have no theoretical background. And what we are just going to do is to investigate uh, how uh, some, for example, typically agents, they do behave in a set of situations. And so typically here I've described, so this issue is, for example, important when you want to simulate how, how people, they just escape from a building when there is a fire. And for this, typically you need to have some very fine grained knowledge of how the agents will react in different situations. And so how different agents will react in different situations. And then you're just to, to, to try to analyze this with a, a finite number of experiments. And when you do this, then, well, you have a, a more a clearer idea of the transition of the state transition of the agents. So when, when they are in this situation, they are going to either to move or just to tidy up their, their desk before leaving the building. And so basically it gives you all the necessary uh, information to describe empirically um, the dynamics of the model. And then you just have to run uh, the model. And 
there are going to, going to be additional knowledge that's generated by the simulation because the knowledge that's additional knowledge that's generated by the simulation is provided by the interaction of the agents. So you have empirical input, empirical dynamics, and and you're going to generate knowledge. So here, this is clear. These are clearly cases in which, well, we seem to have, or it seems to be possible to have a, a empirical dynamics. Uh, a potential objection is that in this kind of cases, you have more than just empirical information because there are two different notions of information that I've more or less uh, not distinguished so far. First, there is a description of the graph. So for that, there is a quantity of information that is needed. So a typical, typically a couple of bits for the rule 110. But there is also uh, the information about the fact that the system in all potential cases is going to behave in the same way. So this is not information about the description of the dynamics, but information about all the list, the potential infinite list of cases in which, and so the information that all particles, all agents are going to behave uh, in all cases in the same uh, in the same way. So this is again um, an, another type of information. Uh, so here again, there is a need for an ampliative step. So and this ampliative step uh, cannot just be provided by experiments. So it seems to be okay. So okay, we are going to to fuel the model with experiments, right? But uh, then there is a I mean. There is still a big step that needs to be uh, carried out, and this step is not carried out experimentally. You more near more or less an inductive step, or or kind of some kind of theorizing that says, look, what I've measured is a good description of how systems behave in general. So, uh, answers to the objection: Yes, it's true. So, but I don't think it's a for the present purpose. It's a good uh, objection, in the sense that this is what you're. What is being described here is that the fact that uh, when you have an experiment, you have information about a particular system, and then there is another step, which is the uh, arguments about the uh, external validity of the experiment. And clearly, the external validity of the experiment is not given by the experiment. So there is an, uh, naturally another layer of argumentation to justify that what you have here is going to be valid in other cases. But this is just a matter of justification. So, um, so, and this is not what I'm discussing here. What I just want to discuss is how you get the information and then you may have, you may need extra uh, knowledge or extra arguments then to argue that the model that you have built is going to be valid for a wide range of, of purposes. And in any case, when you describe the external validity of an experiment, then you are going to say, okay, no, I have larger knowledge, but you are still going to call this experimental knowledge. So I, hear, I, think, by, I think here that by just by parity of reasoning, it's legitimate to say, okay, there is an additional step, but this additional step about the scope of information that I have just uh, collected, harvested uh, experimentally, doesn't change this uh, knowledge into something that is non-empirical knowledge. It's still empirical knowledge, it's just like we've discussed. So the scope of this uh, of this knowledge by non-experimental ways. So if we just say in general that um, when you discuss the external validity of an experiment, you still have empirical knowledge. I think here again you're entitled to say, okay, we have empirically built mo uh, model, and all the dynamics is uh, built by uh, with empirical data, even if clearly there is this uh, external validity uh, stage. Uh, okay. Um, in any case, if you're not happy with this argument, I want to propose other examples in which these arguments, so about the external validity, are no longer a, a worry. And in which, so here I'm trying to, to answer the arguments. And if you're not happy, I've got stronger cases, stronger examples. Say, look, in some cases, still it, it can work. So you don't, so I assume that you don't buy these arguments. So I come to another example, which is a simulation of uh, passive scalars, uh, passive scalar trajectories in the troposphere. 
So it's just a barbarous uh, uh, expression. So I'm just going to give a, describe the example very quickly. So what is a passive scatter? Is something like a chemical or water vapor or pieces of a plane of a wreckage. It's something that don't, doesn't interact with the environment and that is just pushed well, there is the dynamics of the global environment and it just moves and it follows the dynamics of the environment. So the object of the inquiry is how these passive scalars propagate in the atmosphere in particular, uh, where they are created and where they disappear. And the question is to know the exact trajectory of these passive scalars uh, in the atmosphere or in the ocean to analyze, for example, various types of distributions and where where they appear for how long, for example, when it's um, water va vapor, a key question is how long it takes for a water particle just to get uh, dehydrated. And it gets dehydrated when it goes to a cold point and when it goes to a cold, cold point, it's going to rain. And so the, the atmosphere particle becomes uh, dehydrated. So there are plenty of inquiries that you can uh, carry out and that uh, people are doing um, atmosphere studies do uh, do uh, carry out with this kind of study in which you just try to trace the trajectories of particular objects within an environment. So in some cases, what you can try to do is to simulate the whole environment and it's very costly, but well, in some cases you do this. So example, this is a simulation of passive scalars and typically here the passive scalar is just a balloon. So you have balloon and you want to know where, so you, you just launch a balloon in the atmosphere and you want to know where the balloons are going to go. And so you are going to use a, a weather forecast predictions. And then you go, so on the right, I've just put pictures of the, um, of the, of the different wind uh, maps, the wind field maps. And basically the, the balloons are going to follow the, the winds. So in this case, the wind map more or less gives dynamics for the system. It just pushes different objects and then the wind map is going to change. And this depends on you will use your weather predictions for that to know how the dynamics evolves. And eventually you're able just to simulate how the step-by-step -step trajectory of the balloons. So this is a case in which you have uh, uh, trajectories that are simulated and but it still is going to it still uses uh, weather predictions okay but what we are doing here with uh, weather prediction predictions can also be done about uh, past data because actually so the main idea is that you will need to have the wind or to the sea currents so the wind fields and so you have advective moves so you're going to, to try to simulate the evolution of the system just by using the advective moves. So it's just a very simple representation of the dynamics of the model. And, uh, and actually this kind of things are very simple things, but are, it corresponds to beautiful problems in uh, nonlinear dynamics about the mixing. And okay, I'm going to not go into the details, but uh, well, these are clearly uh, important uh, problems. So, if you want to be able to simulate the trajectories of the balloons of, of passing scalars, and you don't want to make any prediction or you don't want to have any imperative step, you just need, you crucially need to have the maps, the wind maps. And you, you have this, well, you're able to have a full blown models to simulate the trajectories. So in usual cases, you make predictions, but if, if the maps correspond to past events, if you're lucky, you can just measure the maps, measure the winds and get uh, wind maps. And this is more or less what is being done in um, meteor meteorological studies. So in these studies, what the people do, or in some particular case, so in these studies, they try to simulate the trajectories of some passive scalars. And what they do is they don't use uh, weather forecast predictions, but on the opposite, they just use uh, maps corresponding to measurement. So you have, you have satellites trying to measure all relevant uh, quantities across uh, the atmosphere. So it can be uh, temperatures, can be winds, pressure. Okay, so you just make global maps. And so with these global maps, well, here it is, you have your dynamics 
and then you are going to be able to study how the different scalars are pushed across the atmosphere. And so basically you have a totally empirical uh, model. So I'm just cheating a little bit here because you also need to have data assimilation system um, models because usually there are holes in your data. So you, and so you need to fill in the holes. Uh, and so to do that, you need also to, 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 to have data assimilation. But from a conceptual point of view, the data assimilation is just to uh, fill in the holes. And basically the, the core of the model is what you have measured. So the core of the model is truly empirical. So eventually it's, it's a very kind of weird model. It's not very unheard of. It's not, you don't have an equation. You just have a very large uh, databases that describes the dynamics of the system on every, so with uh, numerical quantities on every point of a map and for every time step. So it's a very, it, so it's a totally extensional description of the dynamics of the system. And because it's totally extensional, then it can be measured point by point with a, and given by experiments. So more or less, this is what I wanted to have. So um, here, there is no inductive problem. It's not about, about a future um, transition between states because it corresponds to transitions that have already occurred. I mean, you are here, you're not, there is no ampliative step. It's just, you just see how the transitions uh, uh, do take place uh, locally. So no ampliative reasoning uh, about other places, other particulars, other contexts, other circumstances, just measure uh, everywhere. Okay, and still this very, from a conceptual point of view, this extra uh, extrapolation uh, additional module is that you need to fill in the, the different uh, holes in your, in your model. Okay, so uh, final thing, you may say, look, okay, you have empirical data, uh, but just having empirical data about the different winds, they don't by themselves uh, determine the effective dynamics. And uh, even if you know all the phenomenological variables, you still don't have a model. Uh, and here to have a truly a dynamics, you must have something like equation, which is the position of the of scalar particles corresponds to the privileged position, plus how much they are pushed by the wind. And it's true, it's an equation, a very simple equation. Uh, and it's very, very simple in the sense that here we are, just, for example, describing uh, vapor particles. So when you say you have the wind, the wind by definition is just how the different uh, particles in the atmosphere move. So, I mean, almost by definition, you have you have that the next position correspond to the um, to the velocity of, to the to how much wind you have somewhere, and it almost corresponds to the definition of, of the speed of, of the within the atmosphere. So, in this sense, uh, I mean, you have almost no theoretical step. I mean, as soon as you measure so the wind, you have how much there is display. Uh, how much the air, par, air uh, atmosphere particles moves and almost by the definition it just describes how uh, some gas also uh, uh, water vapor is going to move in the atmosphere so it's a first it's a first first rejoinder to this objection that we don't have we still don't have the equation another re rejoinder is that okay even if you need maybe some theoretical bit of knowledge to say look Okay, in this kind of model, here is the equation, and you have the general form of the equation, which is so there is a the particles are just pushed by the wind. So very simple uh, equation, but it's just a general description of the equation, and what is given by the uh, particular uh, measurements is a precise description of the model. So you may say, okay, I just have this general. Uh, additional, which is maybe from theoretical origin, which is, look, the dynamics, the general form of the dynamics is, high, is this. So it's just the general form of the model and then the actual details of the models are provided by the measurement. So it's another way to, 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 to answer. A third way to answer is to say, look, you may simply say, the so naturally, so the content of the model is totally given by empirical means. Then there is something that is different, which is, can you justify that this model actually describes correctly 
uh, so can you, can you justify that your wind model described correctly how much so how the water is going to so water particles are going to move through the atmosphere or how the scholars are going to be propagated and so another uh, rejoiner is that look once again this is remember i just wanted to say the content of the model is provided empirically but i don't claim at all as a justification of the model is provided empirically. And clearly for the, uh, the studies, I mean, uh, I mean, the model is very simple. You just measure things. So these are things by doing by these people, Bonatola and Haynes. But if you have a look at how the models are justified, naturally you have very intense theorizing. Okay, and you have, uh, argue, uh, have pretty heavy argumentations, theories in the background. Okay, but this is just the justification of the model. And here I'm not discussing at all how simulations are justified. So the, another rejoinder is that here again, I think we can generally argue that the models are filled in, are fueled by empirical means, even if, and this is a diff distinct question, they are justified by a wide variety of sources, empirical, uh, the fact that it, it comes, the information comes from empirical sources, which is, uh, I mean, good information. It's because it comes from experiments that we can uh, trust it, but we can trust that, look, the wind was in this way in this particular place, okay? But also by theoretical sources and by maybe by the fact that these models are well entrenched uh, ex and by maybe by mathematical arguments. There are plenty of other sources for the justification of the model, but this is justification. Okay, and this is uh, another dimension of the discussion, and I don't want, don't want to discuss it, just to emphasize that these are distinct independent uh, dimensions. So if you want to be precise concerning how simulations relate to other sources of knowledge, we need to distinguish clearly these dimensions, but are uh, maybe very different. Okay, so final part of the, so I have 10 minutes left. So final part, so to wrap up, Simulations are uh, knowledge providing activities. So simulations provide uh, knowledge. They need to be fed by inputs. So this is correspond to there are some derived sources, uh, contrary to perception, for example, which doesn't need uh, anything, no, no input. Well, it depends how you describe things. Um, so simulations are derived things. So it's legitimate to see how much they can be fed to provide knowledge. And in this particular case, I've tried to show that we can really have the core ingredients of the model simulation that are provided by empirical means. And here, here again, I think it's a much more extreme example than that of model and than that of um, Mary Morgan, in which actually the dynamic core of the model corresponding to the laws of mechanics. Here, we no longer have laws of mechanics, which are such measurement of winds. And this is enough just to investigate the dynamics of the model and how the trajectory is involved and to investigate plenty of interesting uh, quantities. So I think the example is much more extreme than the Bonn uh, example. So more or less what I've tried to say is that, okay, um, simulations are derived sources of, of uh, knowledge. They need to take some input. And I've tried to argue that ba basically they could be fed by very different sources and that they could lie more or less uh, anywhere on this segment. They could be fed almost entire, entirely by theoretical sources or almost entirely by empirical uh, sources. So, I mean, it's just going to depend on the, the simulations. And so I've tried to show that we can lie on the extreme points. So if you want to represent, for example, this simulation, the simulation above on a kind of map, they must be put on the same spot as our experiments are purely empirical or they can be purely theoretical uh, so it's just an answer to so yes so i here i just wanted to emphasize as a pure cases can also exist so um, you really want if you want to investigate uh, to describe conceptually so all potential cases of simulations, you really try to investigate these extreme cases and naturally there are cases uh, in between but um, if you just focus on the places in between or in which things are a little bit empirical or a little bit theoretical, yes, you have the claim that, okay, in simulations, uh, simulations are motley, there are many different types of ingredients. So this is a claim by, by, by Eric, Eric Winsbrook, which is globally true, uh, 
I mean, I'm fine with this. In many cases, yes, simulations are many ingredients of the monthly, but it's not very informative from a conceptual point of view about all the, uh, the, the, all the potential uh, cases that simulations uh, may, may correspond to. So if you just go, it's just a focus on average cases or what is often the case. So here is claims about the mortiness of simulation is more or less a claim that uh, in general simulations are impure. And uh, yes, in general, they are impure. And, uh, but what I need to emphasize that in some cases they are not impure and they can come in on the, the, on the scale of the, where the, what the sources are, they can also be correspond to extreme cases and even to purely empirical uh, cases. So just for the purely uh, theoretical cases in which there is no, um, mathematical tricks, no parameterizations. Yes, there are also cases which is more easy to, to find examples. So an example, for example, is a direct simulations of Navier-Stokes equations. So true in many cases, if you want to simulate Navier-Stokes equations, you run into trouble because of complexity problems. So you have to make phenomenological models. You have, okay, you have to parameterize things. Okay, but in some cases you do really do want to simulate Navier-Stokes equations equations with no approximation. And this is what is called uh, direct simulations in which you're going to simulate all scales from the dissipation scale. So Kolmogorov microscale. So the larger scales uh, corresponds to meters, kilometers uh, in which, and so that you have all the, 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 all the ener energetic scales that are taken into account. So you simulate all scales and yes, this kind of things are, is our, this kind of simulations are rarely carried out because they are extremely uh, costly. But in some cases, uh, you need to do that typically to be able to calibrate other simulations. So it's just, I think, a case in which, well, it's not a motley case. It's a, you know, a pure, another pure case, which is not on the exper experimental side uh, for this one. Okay, so I'm just, so here is just a more open questions. So I've just tried to, to emphasize that, yes, simulations are neutral. They can be fed by different sources and potentially very heterogeneous. And I argue that they can lie anywhere on the line between empirical source and theoretical source. But clearly there are other potential sources for simulation, arbitrary sources, logical mathematical sources. So a more general equation is just to try to go further in this, in this investigation and to give uh, principal arguments concerning what can may feel a simulation. So I've, here I've got uh, no no clues. It's just to emphasize how we could go further in this inquiry. In any case, um, the important fact is that yes, uh, simulations are epistemologically neutral. So are, and when you say that, you have tried to characterize them as a general um, uh, act, uh, scientific activity. But when I say they are neutral, they are not, it doesn't mean that they can, anything can be used to, to feed them. They are just neutral in the sense that different sources and in particular empirical sources can feed them. But still you need to have the right pieces of information to be able to feed the dynamical model. But when you come to the token level, as tokens, so token simulations are deeply heterogeneous. So concerning how can they be fed and they are not necessarily monthly. So here, I just want to emphasize this difference between types, what you say concerning simulation as types and simulation concerning tokens, because it's important because some things are, it's not, are not legitimate to be said about simulation as types. And in many cases, a philosopher of science who just start with a particular case studies and just try to extra extrapolate to simulations in general and potentially because simulations are, seem to be an activity that is deeply heterogeneous, then this methodology, methodology is not uh, legitimate because when something is deeply heterogeneous, then if you just, I mean, cherry pick some example is in there, you're not going necessarily to get some representative uh, example. So from a methodological more is just be careful, it's totally legitimate just to try to, to have a look at cases, but I think when in cases where potentially you suspect uh, there is a wide heterogeneity, then it's just bet better to, to try to adopt uh, the, the Morgan's methodology, which is just chase all, poten the, the, all potentially uh, distinct cases, just chase extreme cases and not 
rely, rely on this uh, case study uh, methodologies, but it's potentially misleading if there is uh, at least for, for some question or for some features, you have uh, the, the target simulations are very heterogeneous. So adopt what I call a more botanical or zoological approach, which is uh, chasing all the weird cases because weird cases are very informative. So in a nutshell, I say that simulations are more or less like epistemic suspense in the sense that uh, when you cook, well, it's legitimate to analyze what suspense are. When you use suspense, you have constraints, you have possibilities that are offered by suspense. So it's legitimate to uh, investigate what these constraints and possibilities are. And when you do that, you're going to investigate suspense as a, as a type. I mean, to say general things about suspense. And it's totally legitimate type of inquiry. And you may even write books concerning how to cook with saucepans. But uh, in the same time, so this type of legitimate inquiry at the type level is legitimate, but you should be careful that in the same time, saucepans are totally neutral concerning the ingredients that it can be used for cooking. They are neutral concerning the types of dishes that you can cook with them. And there is deep heterogeneity of cooking practices with saucepans. So saucepans are just a neutral uh, general uh, tool to, produ to, to produce food. And I think the stimulation is more or less the same thing. Simulation are just a neutral, epistemologically neutral uh, tool to provide, to produce knowledge. And depending on how the tool is used with uh, empirical sources or theoretical sources, then you're going to produce uh, different types of activities and different types of, of knowledge. So the general investigation about suspense are legitimate. But you should not just, if you want to do this, just not make a case studies about how suspense were used in particular cases than to make a general uh, claims about uh, cooking and, and suspense, because then you may be totally wrong. OK, so conclusion about maps. I think here, so I've tried to argue that uh, well, there is no simple map where simulation could be uh, located. Where, it's not, or not, it can be very close to experiments or to theories. And here I just described uh, the relationship of simulations to other sources, but just concerning a content. And potentially things are totally different concerning justification or the shared or distinct scientific roles of these activities. So another implicit claim is that, uh, well, it's a, it's a dead end to try to have this general uh, maps. And if you want to have some kind of sketch to be at the end of the inquiry, and it's going to be just about a particular question. Final uh, puzzlement for me is when you have, okay, so then if I step back and say, okay, so at the end of the day, what type of knowledge is produced by simulations? Because here the claim is that you may, may have almost entirely empirical input, so should I say that the output is going to be also empirical because the dynamical model was empirical, the boundary initial conditions are empirical and I just transform this empirical knowledge into other bits of knowledge. But uh, okay, should I describe this as empirical knowledge? Well, to be honest, I don't know because I hear I feel very ill at ease. Um, in most in a traditional cases, I mean, sources of justification and sources of content are just embodied by the same thing. I mean, you have an experiment, the experiment provides the content, and, the, and it, because it's an experiment, you also trust the result. So the experiment is both source of content and source of justification, and same thing with theories. So when you just have this type of cases, you may say, okay, so you have empirical knowledge on the one hand, theoretical knowledge on the other, and you just have clear cut cases. Here, potentially, things are very different because something is being transformed, and so I'm reluctant to call this empirical knowledge. And at the same time, uh, I want to make a claim that clearly uh, it has been produced by using empirical, almost entirely empirical material. So my final suggestion is that our usual ways of conceptualizing different types of knowledge is maybe just uh, insufficient to describe this uh, this, uh, how we produce knowledge and the different dimensions along which we should describe these different activities. So here, I don't have any suggestions. It's just a suggestion is that we should reconceptualize knowledge by analyzing more sharply the different uh, epistemological dimensions of scientific activities. And at the end of the day, I, uh, my suggestion is that we will not, no longer have this uh, 
a course description about uh, empirical knowledge or phenomenal knowledge and theoretical characterization of knowledge. Or, I think this is all, all two course, but I don't have any suggestion here. But I think the, the general point I've made just suggests that here we should try to think about other, other ways of describing things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. So I stop recording.